Hi everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Alekia Pekabadi. I'm Shelly Grog. Um, during our time in the field, we were placed at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative out of the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Um, IFAI is a technical and legal resource for both tribal producers and Indian governments interested in um, investing in their food systems to make them more helpful and prosperous. So today, the topics we're going to cover include an intro to native hunger and agriculture, an introduction to the theme of food sovereignty, and we'll also be discussing both of our hunger food community report topics, mine being traditional foods, traditional Native American foods, and then Shelley's um, about 638 authority. Um, so before we get into all of that, we wanted to give you an overview of what we're talking about when we're talking about Native populations. Um, so in 2017, there were 5.6 million American Indian and Alaska Native individuals. When we're looking at land, we're looking at 56 million acres of the country that are held in trust. Um, that does not include land privately held by Native American citizens, so the number of Native land is even higher than this. Um, and additionally, there are 573 um, federally recognized tribes. So a lot of times we like to group together native populations because of their shared history of colonization and the lasting impacts of a lot of the policies that the United States has had against um, native people. Um, but while they share this in common, there is a lot of um, difference within these communities. So it's important to remember that when we're looking at tribes and when we're talking about native people, um, there's not a single story. Some background on hunger in native communities. Among the 26 top population uh, American Indian counties, the food insecurity rate was just over 20%. When you compare this to the national average of 15.1%, you can definitely see that there is a difference there. The map below is one that Shelly and I created. We created a map um, of food insecurity rates by county. You can see in the different shades of blue. And then we also overlaid the tribal land boundaries over that, so you can see where there are pockets of more concentrated food insecurity. The Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations is one of two nutri important nutrition assistance programs that are used by Native American communities. Uh, this is program is an alternative to SNAP in some rural communities and reservation communities. They don't have access to SNAP authorized retailers, so this program provides commodity food packages to those requiring nutrition assistance. This program serves about 90,000 participants per month. But SNAP is also really important. We see that just over a quarter of, 20, or of Native American households receive SNAP benefits every month, compared to just 13% of households nationwide. So an important part of our work at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative was focusing not on just hunger, but on the production of food by Native farmers. So when we're looking at the scope of Native producers, 2% of all farms in the US are held by Native Americans. Um, and they own 6% of all the farmland. So their farms are about two times the size of the average American farm, which means there's a lot of promise and um, undertapped resources within this community. Um, and again, there's, there's nearly 72,000 um, American Indian and Alaska Native farmers. However, there's a lot of disparity in these groups. So if you look at this uh, chart over here, um, you can see that the darker line, or the darker part of the bar is American Indian and Alaska Native farms, and the lighter color is non uh, American Indian and Alaska Native farmers. Um, this is just looking at farms on reservation land, but as you can see, non-native farmers um, are renting about 25% of all farms on reservation land. Um, they're controlling less than 30% of the acres of those farmland, but they're accounting for over 80% of the market value. So the farms that are being run by non-native farmers on reservation land are making vastly more money than the farms that are run by native farmers themselves. Another concept that was really important to our work and was kind of is just a common thread of the work that IFAI does is food sovereignty. And this is the right of people to define their own food systems. So when you're thinking about food sovereignty, you're really putting people at the center of food systems instead of um, special interests and profits. Uh, it values producers as well as consumers, localizing markets, uh, intergenerational knowledge sharing, and sustainability. Oh, and um, while this is a term that has been used a lot in food justice spaces. It holds particular weight in Native communities where there is both the historical and legal precedent of sovereignty of tribal nations. We had the opportunity to see food sovereignty in practice when we visited the Quapaw Nation of Oklahoma. We visited the tribe and were able to tour their greenhouses, meat processing facilities, coffee grocery, all sorts of facilities where they're producing foods that's, that's going directly back into their communities. So this was an incredible opportunity for us to see food sovereignty in practice and a great model for other tribes to take on as well. 
The community, the Hunger Free Community Report that I wrote focused on the nutritional value and health benefits of traditional Native American foods for Native American communities. This is really important because uh, there has been a change over the past few centuries in the diets of Native American populations that has led to a lot of the health disparities that we see today. My report focuses on foods from various regions, highlighting their nutritional value and their the opportunities that exist um, when reintroducing those foods into diet to rebuild indigenous health. This is one example of some of the foods that I spoke of in my report. Uh, king salmon and sockeye salmon are just a few examples of meat or protein sources that are much higher in omega-3 fatty acids than a lot of our conventional protein sources that are commonly eaten in Native American communities. They're, this now, these foods are specific to the Pacific Northwest and Alaskan tribes, so this is not um, fit for all communities, but just one example of traditional foods that have a lot of nutritional value and can provide a lot of mental and physical benefits for Native American populations. So my report that I did was on 638 Authority. So 638 Authority enables tribes to take over control of federal programs, services, activities, and functions. Um, I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty technical details, but um, essentially it'll, it operates almost like a block grant, wherein tribes are passed money from the federal government that otherwise the federal government would have run the program and instead passes the control to the tribal organizations that can operate either in a regional consortium or individually um, as a tribal entity in order to administer those programs. Um, this, ena this enables them to tailor the program to their community's needs, focus on their own priorities, um, and within the 2018 Farm Bill, this authorized pilot programs to bring these 638 contracts to the USDA. Previously, uh, it has only been legal to, use, to legal to be used within the Indian Health Services and the Department of Interior. Um, it's widely used by tribes within those departments. Over 300 tribes currently use 638 contracts and compacts. Um, and an IHS study found that when using 638 contracts and compacts, it increased participation, led to more comprehensive approaches, was more responsive to community needs, improved coordination, led to innovation, and increased efficiency and decreased service duplication. So there's a lot of promise that can come from these 638 contracts and passing this control to tribal entities. Um, and within the USDA, it has the potential to be a tool for fully realizing this idea of food sovereignty in Native communities. So one of the places it's, it's been piloted is the food distribution program at Indian reservations that Alakia spoke about earlier. Um, so some examples of how this pilot project for 638 Authority in Fidipper, um can be seen is including tribal-specific traditional foods into food packages. So again, as Alakia mentioned, um, traditional foods have a lot of health benefits, and um, they are not the same for all tribal nations. As we talked about earlier, there's nearly 600 federally recognized tribes, and all of those tribes have very different histories and very different regions that they come from, which allow them to access different foods. And so by enabling tribes to have control over the food distribution program, that enables them to design their own food packages um, and incorporate more of their specific traditional foods. It also allows for regional coordination, decreasing some of the inefficiencies that happen when the program is operating at the federal level. And also, going back to native producers, it allows um, tribes to invest in their own local native producers to help uh, with economic development of their communities. And finally, we want to touch on some of the things that we've learned over the course of our field placement, um, learning how to be a better ally to the Native American community. First of which is the disaggregation of data. Oftentimes we see that data is not disaggregated, and a lot of times Native American communities are also left out of those breakdowns when we're talking about race. So it's really important for us to break down uh, by race in order to highlight potential disparities and also better address those disparities. Another point that we wanted to bring up is emphasizing inclusion, bringing indigenous voices forward to highlight their stories and perspectives and knowledge. Um, this is not to imply that this should be done in an extractive or tokenizing way, but rather by building um, sustained relationships um, with organizations that already exist, such as the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, um, in order to get a better understanding and build these long-term relationships. Educating yourself is also really important, and this is what we've been doing over the past six months at our field placement, learning more about the unique challenges and cultures and histories of tribes to understand how we can better serve them, and also to reverse the erasure of indigenous history that has happened over the past few centuries, bringing awareness to their continued presence in our country. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, resisting the single story, um, stereotyping Native people into one 
one category rather than um, recognizing the huge, vast differences that exist across tribes and within tribes as well. Um, and this, again, extends to trying to create one-size-fits-all solutions that are going to work for everyone within Indian country when that is not the case. Um, these are some of our sources. Um, if you have questions about where we got some of our facts and figures, um, feel free to let us know. We can connect you to those sources. And we have some time for questions. always really helpful is uh, state parity and so um, tribal entities are sovereign nations and so in a lot of ways they are supposed to be seen as equal playing field to states um, not within states but parity to them um, and so this farm bill also had a lot of provisions that specified that that tribes were eligible for certain funding that states had previously only been explicitly eligible for um, and so things of that nature I think is really important in just recognizing that that tribal parity to states <laughs> So our visit was facilitated by IFAI. They have a really close relationship with the Quabla Nation, and we actually were able to go to the Intertribal Agriculture Council's annual meeting in Las Vegas, so bringing, to our, bringing together all of the big players in native agriculture, and all of the food that was served at one of our lunches was provided by the Quabla Nation. So that's where we made that connection that we would love to go see this facility where these foods are being produced. I'm not exactly sure about the history of how they started um, those projects that they're working on and how they've built this processing facility and their greenhouses, but I know that they're trying to be a model for other tribes too, to continue building food sovereignty. Um, and one point to add to that, I know that we spoke a little bit um, with Michelle who showed us around while we were in Quapa, and she was speaking about the meat processing facility that they've opened, which is the only tribally run meat processing facility, um, and it was opened in, within the last five years, and so it's still relatively new. Um, and one of the things that she wanted to make clear, because there are other tribes that are interested in pursuing this model, is the fact that it's not necessarily going to be a huge financial gain at first. And there's a lot of costs in terms of startup, in terms of continuing to run it. They're very specific about um, how they treat their animals and raise those animals, and there are certain costs associated with that um, that is, I think will pose challenges for other tribes interested in, um, in making a commitment to um, food sovereignty within their own tribes. or did you connect with Slow Food Nations out in Denver? Um, I think it's in July, it's in July last year. In July this year, there are many different, uh, if you don't know about it, it's part of the Slow Food um, Network and movement and native peoples from all over the, over the world come together to, to basically it's like a food summit on food sovereignty and food justice. You guys would be, uh, I think, you know, a, a welcome very cool. Um, for anybody uh, that's on the Facebook Live, that you know that that's Slow Food Nation, you said, or Slow Food? Slow Food Nation. Okay. So if you look up Slow Food, uh, it's like slowfood.org, um, okay. and Slow Food Nations, that it, it's kind of like a summit, uh, is kind of part of it. The Slow Food is the organization, Slow Food Nations is, the, is a program or a summit. Yes, so the question was um, regarding food safety. Uh, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture actually hosts a lot of trainings, both webinars online and in-person trainings, that they are trying to help producers stay in compliance with some of the new food safety protocols that are in place. Um, so they're a really big resource, along with all the other things that they do, making sure that tribal producers have access to that information and so that they can stay compliant and be most successful with their um, food production. 
Um, I know that IFAI does a lot of work with youth engagement, um, and that like the age of farmers is a global issue. I think the average age of a farmer is either 60 or 65. I never remember, but I'm sure that this is a problem that Native communities are facing as well. So I was wondering if you all could talk a little bit about the youth engagement that your organization does and any engagement work that you all did. Um, so we didn't have a chance to really engage with our youth engagement um, opportunities, but IFAI hosts an annual uh, gathering training for youth that are interested in um, getting involved with Native agriculture. Uh, it's something that they do every year. They have a huge summit. They bring people together to kind of get them talking about this issue. Um, additionally, when we were at the Intertribal Agricultural Council's um, annual meeting, uh, they had a huge emphasis on youth as well. They had um, an essay sharing competition. So while we were eating this delicious Nation food, we also got to listen to um, you, the winners of this, the finalists of this uh, essay competition to talk about uh, their interest in agriculture and their importance within their own communities. Um, as well as we also sat um, in on um, the Seeds of Native Health held a conference. Seeds of Native Health? Okay. Um, and uh, they had a huge panel also on intergenerational um, farming and they had um, one session that had a, a whole family up, like three generations worth of farmers. Um, to talk about what that meant. And so there's definitely has been a huge push in terms of um, attaching it to intergenerational knowledge sharing and trying to engage youth, but um, our work didn't necessarily really focus on that. I have a question about uh, sort of like larger grocery store access. Um, if you can speak to this maybe when you all visited Oklahoma, um, were there any conversations about um, the development of grocery stores on native land, if they are ran by native folks or there are more opportunities um, for that development to take place in like private um, public partnerships, or if that's something that has a bit of resistance because it might be seen as imposing or not, you know, providing the foods that are culturally relevant um, to those spaces. We haven't heard much of grocery store development, but I know that a lot of tribes and some that we've seen have a lot of corner stores or convenience stores. And there's a big movement to get more fresh, healthy foods into those spaces. Um, so maybe not grocery stores, but they are trying to make a shift in what's available at corner stores and convenience stores to provide increased access to uh, fresh, healthy foods and particularly um, culturally appropriate foods as well. And um, I think also just to kind of continue on that point is, um, as Lakia talked about when we were talking about the food distribution program on Indian reservations, um, there is, because uh, reservations are often located in very rural areas, um, there is an incredible lack of grocery stores within those communities for the most part, which is why um, the Dipper has become a necessity in these communities is because of the fact that they don't have access to SNAP authorized vendors um, and therefore have to um, instead turn to the commodity programs that um, supply them with their food that, that they might not be able to access at the store without driving um, two hours or, or more sometimes. Another one. <laughs> I'm just very engaged. I'm very engaged. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that the Dipper um, can sort of operate like a block grant program. Is there um, desire to turn it into an entitlement program? Um, like, how often does it mm -hmm. run out? Is it meeting the need? Um, what's like the utilization rate, for, like for estimated need? Like, what would be like the pie in the sky asks for a super successful Fedora program? Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily a lot of talk around actually turning it into an entitlement program. Um, one thing to note though is the fact that um, even looking at the most recent um, shutdown, the government shutdown and how that impacted services, um, there's a lot of concern about, thankfully food had been ordered enough in advance that it wasn't gonna be damaged, but um, there was a lot of concern amongst um, Native folks in terms of if food was gonna last, how long it was gonna last, how ordering was gonna happen, how distribution from the warehouses was gonna go. Um, so challenges like that in terms of funding is definitely something that um, I know that is top of mind. I will say also, as of now, there are only two distribution warehouses in the entire United States for the Fidiver program. So all of the food from that for that program comes from two places and goes out to the rest of the country. So in terms of funding, I think, I mean, there uh, one of the students at the University of Arkansas where the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative is did a report on um, regional warehouses, transferring to a model like that that would actually make the program more efficient and save money actually. So I think in terms of more funding, I, with using the same amount of funding, we would be able to make the program more efficient. So it's, I don't think it's an idea of trying to get more funding. I mean, I, I think the program could use more funding, 
um, but also maybe shifting how the food is distributed and from where is important too. And tying that back into 638 authority, um, kind of just looking at uh, the fact that, again, because there are these two regional centers, local procurement is pretty difficult because in order to source food, it has to go back to these warehouses in order to be distributed again. So food is traveling very, very far out of communities in order to even come back into it, um, which I think is one of the reasons that um, potentially 638 is a huge opportunity to kind of help keep, just keep that food within communities rather than having to do um, this inefficiency of traveling out and then back in. Yeah. 